They were the elite, the SAS of medieval knights in armor. They thought they were invincible. They would go in first, they would come out last. Rich. And they're effectively multinational corporations. The keepers of holy relics said to have mystical powers. If you touch them, then you had a connection with God. But when the Templar Knights were smashed by the French king... It was a medieval equivalent of a, a dawn police raid. ...their legendary treasure disappeared. They found nothing. Yet alluring and intriguing clues survive, shrouded in mystery. They were fanatically secretive. From ancient French castles and secret codes to an ingenious pit across the Atlantic. If you try and get the treasure, you'll drown. Could this be the tantalizing trail that leads to the lost treasure of the Knights Templar? Turn back the eternal tide of time by almost a thousand years, and an enduring legend begins. A legend forged on the long and dangerous pilgrim route from Western Europe to the Holy Land and the hallowed city of Jerusalem. Travelers risked violence and even death at the hands of bandits who preyed on pilgrims around sacred Christian sites like the Sea of Galilee. A Russian monk who visited the region described the danger in 1106. This place is very dreadful and dangerous. Many tall palm trees stand about the town like a dense forest. This place is terrible and difficult of access, for here live fierce pagan Saracens who attack travellers at the fords. Travel along the roads was very dangerous because any lord who owned land by the side of the road reckoned it was his right to take toll off anyone that passed. Protection money, if you like. Some groups decided not to pay and fought. So notoriously, certain pilgrim groups didn't get to Jerusalem because they were either cut to pieces or taken prisoner. Amid the turbulent times of the early Crusades, a small group of devout French knights appeared in Jerusalem, willing to dedicate their lives to Christ. The country needed fighters, not just men that prayed. And so, the later accounts say, they went to the Patriarch of Jerusalem, the head of the church in Jerusalem, and said, we want to do something to help Christendom, we are knights. And he said, for your sins, I order you to protect the pilgrim roads. These were highly trained fighters. Um, the knights were at the top of the medieval military machine. They were the medieval equivalent of a tank, a fully armed knight on a horse, which was also armoured. Um, it was pretty formidable, so it could have only taken one or two knights to protect a road and keep it fairly safe. They became known as the Knights Templar after basing themselves on part of Jerusalem's historic Temple Mount. Apparently the Templars asked to be based in the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which they referred to as the Temple of Solomon. They believed that it went back to the reign of King Solomon, that great wise king of ancient Israel. The Temple of Solomon had been destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD during the Jewish uprising. So nothing was left, but it was an area steeped in mythology. Solomon was famously the wisest of all men. Once called the Poor Knights of Christ, the Templars became rich, enjoying papal privileges, lucrative tax breaks and lavish donations. The Templars became very rich because people in the West heard about what they were doing and thought, great, I want to help. So they gave them money, they left the money in their wills, they gave them land, which raised their income. They even created their own kind of bank and the equivalent of a modern traveler's check to protect pilgrims' money. The Templars did develop a system whereby you handed in your money, for example, in Paris, you've got a chip that said this money has gone in, you present your chip when you arrive in Acre, and you could have your money back again. The Templars had become rich and influential in cities across Europe. For the pious, envious, cash-strapped French king, Philip the Fair, the knights had become a threat, rivals to his authority that had to be eliminated. Philip was determined to destroy the order and would stop at nothing to achieve his ends. The mighty order of knights would be brought down by charges of the most heinous of crimes, heresy. He had installed spies in the order. He got people to join the order and um, they were reporting back to Philip saying um, strange things are going on. A month before the arrests, secret 
instructions were sent out to the king's officials, the bailey and the seneschals in the various parts of France, and they were instructed the Templars were to be arrested at dawn on Friday the 13th of October, and nothing was to be said about this beforehand. So it was a dawn swoop. The medieval equivalent of a, a dawn police raid, it was a very well, a very slick operation that was carried out seemingly without any warning. Um, almost all the Templars in France were arrested. Oh yes, psychology is not a modern invention. It was well known in the Middle Ages that if you want to catch somebody off guard, dawn when they're still in bed is the best time to get them. And the Templars were arrested on this Friday the 13th, something which shocked people, as they were a very powerful and established group, and there were literally hundreds of those centres. And this event was so shocking that to this day, the idea of Friday the 13th in France is synonymous with bad luck. Thrown into prison and tortured, many confessed to shocking crimes of heresy. Philip the Fair, he was very clever with his um, spin doctors. He got them to confess, under torture of course, that they denied Christ and spat on the cross. The charges of heresy were stitch up. These were standard charges brought against other people that the King of France wanted to get rid of and get their money. The Pope was also threatened by the French King's inquisitors and was forced to dissolve the Order of the Templar Knights in 1312. Several years later, after languishing in prison, the Templar's elderly Grand Master Jacques de Molay was burnt to death as a heretic. He suddenly showed a huge amount of resolve. He's also said by some chroniclers to have called the Pope and King Philip to meet him before God within the year to account for their actions. This has become known as the curse of Jacques de Molay. And it came true, apparently. The Pope died on the 20th of April, just a month later, of a stomach complaint. And Philip himself died before the end of that year. He died in November 1314 in a hunting accident. Um, he was a fanatical huntsman, and um, at this time um, he didn't come back from the hunt. The place where Jacques de Molay was burnt alive, together with one of his companions, can still be seen in Paris today. Two tomb-shaped portals mark the spot where the life of the last Grand Master was extinguished. But some 700 years on, the legend of the Templars continues to thrive. Myths that have swirled around them through time tell of fantastic treasures and divine relics found deep in the ruins of Solomon's fabled temple. The idea that the Templars were digging into the Temple Mount is a modern one. Nobody at the time wrote about that. And I think the Templars would have talked about it had they been doing it as well, because they liked to advertise their activities as a way of raising money. During some excavations carried out in the 19th century, a tunnel was discovered, which has been dubbed the Templar Tunnel. It's not beyond the realms of possibility that the Templars could have discovered something whilst renovating their part of the Temple platform. If they were interested in the legends of King Solomon, one of the stories about Solomon was his fabulous wealth. Apart from, you know, apart from his wisdom, he also had a lot of gold. And we know that the, the treasure of the temple was actually gold and silver and precious stones and so on, which after 70 AD, when the Romans destroyed the temple, went missing. Could such legendary riches excavated from the heart of the Holy Land still lie hidden in a secret Templar treasury? Links between the Knights Templar and legendary holy relics have some foundation. Evidence recently uncovered suggests the Templars hid the Shroud of Turin, set to hold an image of the crucified body of Christ. Could the Templars have secretly removed such treasures from the Paris Temple before their arrest in 1307? When Philip's men went into the Paris Temple on that Friday morning, all they found basically were Templars. Um, they didn't find any treasure, troves, no storerooms or chests full of gold. The hunt for the fabled lost treasure of the Knights Templar had begun. According to one alluring tale, a band of French knights escaped before Philip's dawn raid, taking their hoard of treasure west, towards England and a former Templar fortress as Gisors. Perched on a huge mound, or mot, it was here that some Templars found themselves imprisoned in their own tower. 
Etched into the walls of the so-called prisoner's tower, ancient graffiti can still be seen at Gizor, including enigmatic symbols interpreted by some as clues pointing to the Templar's lost treasure. A chariot, which may have been used to transport riches and biblical relics, and mysterious figures of what appear to be North American Indians. The former Templar stronghold has attracted many visitors through the ages, including a Victor Hugo. But was it the prolific creative artist who wrote Les Miserables who signed his name in the ancient walls? One has to wonder if it was just someone else who engraved Victor Hugo's name. Luckily, we know that Victor Hugo wrote that he really did visit Gizor and that the site had a profound effect on him. In fact, he details that he carved his name twice at the castle. Victor Hugo was not the only one to be enchanted by the enigmatic Templar castle at Gizor. A caretaker, Roger Lamois, moved into the fortress in 1929. He sparked a sensation and a frantic hunt for the legendary lost treasure. This is where he worked and lived, and he knew the legends told in the area about the treasure which might be a Templar treasure. Clearly, he was impressed, so impressed that he started to search. Imagine being in his place. The end of the day comes, the castle is closed, and he is alone. So he starts digging, and he will do whatever he needs to do, taking his time. He even asked for permission from the town hall to excavate, and the town hall told him, yes, go on, excavate. If you find something, then we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. So, he pushes ahead. The Germans come and seize the castle. He's very worried, but in spite of everything, he carries on. It becomes his obsession. He keeps going and searching. He carries on searching. The war ends, and the Germans leave, and he keeps going, he keeps searching. And one day, he is digging above us here in the dungeon. He digs an amazing pit, and there he finds something. Roger Lemoy claimed to have found an underground chapel crammed with vast riches. In lurid detail, he described an elaborate vault with 19 stone sarcophagi, each two meters long, and 30 chests full of precious metal, none other than the Templar's lost treasure. He alerted the local authorities, but when a town committee investigated the dig, all they saw was a hole in the ground. When people arrive to check what he has told them, all they see is a pit that has not been securely supported and which has been constructed in levels. It does not seem stable and looks as though it's going to collapse. Two people nevertheless try to go down but come back again quickly for fear of being buried alive. The head of the local fire brigade was one of those who risked their lives to investigate the pit. Once safely back on the surface, he reported a tantalizing clue. One of the things the chief fireman was reported to have said was that he threw a stone in and that he did hear an echo. But at no point did he say that it was an underground room. He just said that he heard an echo. And that is the only testimony that confirms that Lemoyne did find a cavity. Despite the fire chief's fascinating report, local authorities ordered that the unstable pit should be filled in as soon as possible. The caretaker, who claimed to have found a vast Templar crypt filled with treasure, was also sacked and expelled from the castle. The pit was filled, but the legend of lost Templar treasure could not be buried. Then, in the 1960s, a popular book sparked renewed interest in the so-called secret chapel. The French culture minister ordered a full-scale excavation. It is highly probable that André Marot was persuaded of the presence of something within the mot, and he then ordered archaeologists to come and start digging. And in the first instance, they agreed, since there was a possibility of finding something. Some searches were made. 
But very quickly, the archaeologist announced that it was not possible for the Mott to be hiding an empty cavity. But Marot insisted very strongly on carrying on the searches, digging, etc. As the archaeologists ran out of money to carry on this task, after a while they decided to stop working on this site. And this is when André Marot decided to send in the army. The army battled through excavations at the Mott for more than a month. At the end of the operation came a curt report. The result was negative. But once again, the legend of the Templar's lost treasure refused to die, despite the lack of any real evidence. The military forces acted as military forces do. So they sealed the perimeter and they dug and evacuated the earth, which is the origin of the theory of trucks carrying off the treasure buried in the mount. The fact that we are forgetting is that they never found a construction. If it existed, they would have found it, but nothing was found. There's no evidence anything was actually found at Gisor. Stories circulate, but when you look at the stories, they're contradictory. Nothing's actually been produced that says this was found at Gisor. So it's another one of these treasure hunter stories. Intriguing, but when you dig in there, there's nothing there. But why would the discredited caretaker Roger Lemois invent such a lurid story of a secret Templar chapel? One person who knew the caretaker suggests he was acting on real information, meaning that somewhere, somehow, a hidden Templar treasury may well be waiting to be found. Roger Lemois never entered this room. He never found it. However, he knew of an exact description of the room, for he may have had a plan of it. And Roger Lemoyne, crafty as he was, adopted the following tactic. He dug, obviously, but he didn't find anything, at least not the chapel. He decided to gain maximum publicity, knowing that if the chapel was found, he would be granted a share of the discovery. Despite lack of evidence, it's part of a widow's or the tins tapped at pillar on the well, Tevas to Balavites, a sitting perch with a hoard of treasure. If it wasn't buried at Gizor, perhaps clues, or even the treasure itself, lies beyond France, across the Channel in Britain. In a historic corner of London, street names, a tube station, and a Templar church still stand as evidence of the night's once influential presence in the capital. The design of the Temple Church in London was inspired by the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Inside lies real historical treasure stone effigies of Templar knights and other relics of the past. From London, the legendary Templar treasure trail leads to the northwest and an old country family estate, where a collection of Georgian follies appear to contain tantalizing clues. The house and gardens at Shugborough Hall were built and landscaped by the rich and influential Anson family. The Anson family date back for a very long time. They were English nobility, English aristocrats, and they were very close to royalty and to the government. I would use the word influential. They were very important people who were effective in altering history. The Anson family fortune was amassed by George Anson, a navigator and Royal Navy captain 
who attacked Britain's enemies on the high seas. His capture of a Spanish galleon and its phenomenal treasure made the Anson family especially rich. After George Anson died, it was his brother Thomas who took over responsibility for the family estate, spending vast amounts of his deceased brother's money. The monuments at Shugborough were built um, on the back of this Spanish silver that was captured, the Spanish treasure. Um, and Thomas Anson, the elder brother who was able, who lived here, wanted to spend all the money, really wanted to place Shugborough into a, a, a national league. He wanted Shugborough to be considered amongst the most important houses of the day. So he used all this money to use the best architects, the best um, artists, and to completely cover the, uh, the, the, the parkland with these up-to-date, brand new, modern uh, monuments. Very different, very unique. Of the eight monuments scattered across the grounds, one has been linked to the legend of the Templar's lost treasure. It's the so-called Shepherd's Monument, referring to a copied image of the Arcadian shepherds by the French painter Nicolas Poussin. Letters carved into the marble below are seen by some as part of a secret code linked to an ancient enigma. One of the strangest and most intriguing mysteries about the Shepherd Monument here in Shugborough are the, the ten letters underneath the monument itself. There's a D lower than the other eight with an M at the far end. The alleged cipher that uses these separate letters etched into the Shepherd's Monument has been nicknamed the DM code. Those who believe it could be the key to an ancient mystery claim that the DM code was mentioned by the infamous 16th century prophet of doom, Nostradamus. A quatrain in his book Centuries reads, When the inscription DM is found in the ancient cave revealed by a lamp, Law the king and Prince Ulpian tried, the queen and duke in the pavilion undercover. This could be interpreted as, when the DM code is decrypted, a very ancient underground place will be found then laws, kings and princes will be seriously tried. Could this underground place refer to a secret Templar chapel? The DM code is a relatively modern invention, yet people have been trying to decipher it for more than 200 years. Perhaps the key that could unlock the DM code lies beyond the enigmatic gardens of Shugborough Hall. In Paris, where the painting featured on the Shepherd's Monument Nicolas Poussin's 17th century masterpiece, The Arcadian Shepherds, is kept at the Louvre. The painting features three shepherds and a woman gathered around a tomb in a dreamlike landscape representing Arcadia, a kind of ancient Greek paradise on earth. On the tomb, a Latin inscription reads, Et in Arcadia ego which could be translated as, I too am in Arcadia. But there is another entirely unorthodox translation. The Latin phrase can also be read as an anagram, I tego arcane dei, which means, I keep God's secrets. The shepherd's hands have also been seen as lying in an unnatural and uncomfortable position. Was the artist trying to convey some sort of hidden message? Nicolas Poussin was commissioned to paint the Arcadian shepherds for an influential cardinal who would eventually become Pope. It wasn't only the painting, but the artist himself who seemed to attract the attention of influential figures. The King of France was interested in Nicolas Poussin, 
and a letter between mutual friends of both men seems to suggest that the painter held the key to some fantastic secret. Part of that letter reads, He and I have planned certain things about which I will be able to fill you in shortly, things that, because of Monsieur Poussin, will give you advantages that kings would find it difficult to extract from him, and perhaps after him nobody will rediscover for centuries to come. And these are things so difficult to search for that nothing on earth could be of better fortune, and this cannot be equaled. What were these secrets that could give such fantastic advantage to their holder that nobody on earth would be able to gain it again for centuries to come? Legends of treasure hidden by the mystical Knights Templar and an apparent trail of clues left in ancient monuments and paintings leads to a historic church in the Eternal City, Rome. The Church of San Lorenzo in Lucina was erected on ruins linked to an ancient Christian cult. Curious relics include a small door which opens to reveal a throne, used exclusively by the Pope during Privy Council meetings, and a monument dedicated to the French painter Nicolas Poussin. Beneath his bust is another engraved replica of his famous painting, The Arcadian Shepherds. It's this mysterious picture that was chosen to honor his memory above hundreds of other works. A fellow countryman, the novelist Chateaubriand, had the monument erected in 1832. It features a Latin verse that pays homage to Poussin, but it also seems to suggest that his paintings hold some sort of clue. Hold back your pious tears. Poussin lives in this tomb. He had given his life without knowing how to die. He keeps quiet in here, but if you want to hear him speak, it's surprising how he lives and talks in his paintings. If Poussin held some kind of magnificent secret, perhaps the solution can be found in his paintings. The Arcadian Shepherds has attracted the interest of influential people over the centuries, including King Louis XV, and hundreds of years ago, it was this very painting that the great navigator George Anson had engraved on the mysterious Shepherds Monument at Shugborough Hall. But this carved replica is not the same. A finger that originally pointed to the letter N is missing. The carved image has also been inverted, with the addition of a pyramid on top of the tomb. What does it all mean? There are many theories and interpretations, and some of these lead back to that mysterious and secretive order of holy knights, the Templars. Some say the carving represents the tomb of Christ, the shepherdess Mary Magdalene, and the bearded shepherd, a Templar knight. Letters are also said to be hidden in the carved image. Letters that point to a compelling tale of knights crossing the Atlantic centuries before Columbus discovered the Americas. According to this theory, Letters on the monument can be decoded to read the name of the Canadian province, Nova Scotia. Amazingly, one of the words that appears in the carving of Poussin's painting refers to exactly the same part of the world. By taking out the R in Arcadia, as suggested by the shepherd's thumb, the word Acadia appears. This is the old French name for Nova Scotia. But what links the Knights Templar and their legendary lost treasure to a far-off shore across the Atlantic in Canada? The trail of these elusive knights and fabled riches found in the heart of the Holy Land now moves to the North American continent.
here, evidence of secret societies linked to the Templars can be traced back to the earliest recorded settlements on Canada's east coast. The French colony was governed by Isaac de Razali, a great knight in the Hospitalier Order of St. John of Jerusalem, which inherited some of the Templars' worldly goods. A descendant of those early settlers, Yoel Doucet, has tried to find the origin of the French name Acadia. We're not sure of the origin. In 1524, an explorer called Verrazano named the region surrounding Philadelphia Arcadia, a paradise on earth according to Greek mythology. And some people think that when the maps were copied, the region was moved higher on the map. <laughs> but later, in Arcadia, they dropped the R to make Acadia. We are not 100% sure. According to another theory, the name Acadia comes from the indigenous Mi'kmaq Indians. Like other native people on the North American continent, their legends pass down through generations. They tell of white-skinned people who came from the ocean well before Columbus. Intriguingly, some Mi'kmaq Indian art resembles the Red Templar cross on a white background. But there's no evidence they made it to North America, a long way from their original mission in Jerusalem. Templars escaping to America is a great fantasy, isn't it? What would be the point in taking treasure to Nova Scotia when the whole point of the order was to protect Jerusalem? Yet in Nova Scotia, the appropriately named Gold River leads to more glittering conjecture and legends of hidden Templar treasure. The river flows into Mahoney Bay, where one of a dozen islands hides a real mystery which remains unsolved to this day. The Oak Island treasure pit legend began in 1795. A local man, Daniel McGinnins, apparently stumbled on a small glade amid the oak trees. He saw the faint outline of a small depression as if something was buried there. Believing he may have stumbled across a hoard of pirate treasure, he went back to get tools and two friends to help him. Local tourism director Danny Henniger describes what happened next. They started digging in this uh, depression, fully expecting to find pirate gold. They dug down about two feet and struck something hard in the hole with their shovels. And of course, they were expecting to find a treasure chest. And as they uncovered this uh, object in the hole, they discovered that the 13-foot um, the, uh, diameter depression was actually opening up into a 13-foot diameter shaft. And the, the, the hard thing that they struck in the hole was actually a layer of flagstones that was covering the mouth of the shaft that had been refilled. So they continued digging, taking those rocks out, and expecting, of course, any moment to find treasure. Some three meters down, there was no treasure, but a kind of wooden platform. They removed it and kept digging, only to find another wooden platform nine meters beneath the surface. And at that time, of course, they felt that they were in over the heads, excuse the, uh, the pun, but uh, they decided then to try and get help from uh, mainlanders and um, they couldn't get any help. People were actually scared of Oak Island because it's always had a superstitious um, character about it. And of course, at that time in 1795, people didn't have the time really to pursue a treasure hunt. And a lot of people thought these three young men were quite crazy, actually. New excavations began several years later in 1803. Around every three meters, the treasure hunters hit a platform of wooden beams, heart-shaped stones, fragments of coal, and coconut fibers were also found. Then some 28 meters down, they hit a mysterious stone. The stories tell us that the digging was easy, and we interpret that as meaning that there weren't a lot of large stones to be removed, and the, the earth was easily removed, obviously, because they'd been refilled again. So at the 90 foot, 93 foot level, they found the stone that later became known as the warning stone or the inscribed stone. And when they rolled the stone over, they found that there's characters etched into the face of the stone such as none of them could interpret. It wasn't a known language, at least to anybody there at the time. And they took the stone and 
pitched it to one side and continued digging in the bottom of this pit. The purpose of the so-called warning stone became clear. It appeared to mark a boundary. Digging beyond it, workers found themselves engulfed by water flooding into the pit. The next day or so, when they came back, they finished off this dig, they discovered there was 60 feet of water laying in this pit, and they tried to bail it out, and they couldn't. They tried uh, bailing it with buckets. They didn't have pumps at that time, at least not on Oak Island to use, and uh, their spirits were crushed, and they basically left Oak Island. The flooded pit remained inaccessible for more than 40 years. The infamous warning stone disappeared. By the 1900s, the pit attracted hordes of treasure hunters, eager to try their luck at defeating the flood defenses that seemed to protect whatever was buried there. They included a certain Franklin D. Roosevelt, future president of the United States. No treasure has been found but evidence has been uncovered of an ingenious tidal flood trap. One of the most vexing and damning problems trying to secure the treasure or solve the mystery of Oak Island has been the water that has appeared deep underground in Oak Island. At first, of course, people thought it was natural water inclusion until they discovered it was uh, salt water. And not only was it salt water, but it rose and fell with the tide. So they knew there must be a, a connection between the money pit, where they were dig digging for their treasure, and the ocean. And they went to the, what was then the most obvious location, 520 feet away in a place called Smith's Cove. So as they're walking across the beach, when the tide went out, they noticed the water was gushing from the beach from the sand as if it was being squeezed from a giant sponge. They noticed that was a very unusual trait to find in any beach, so they started to uh, do some excavation. And when they were finished, they had excavated over 145 feet of the beach surface, five feet deep, and they discovered, buried under layers of sand and gravel and stones, eelgrass, and so much coconut fiber. The artificial beach concealed an elaborate network of channels. They ended in a kind of storm drain linked to the so-called treasure pit. It is felt by many people that this is a structure that was um, artificially buried in the ground by the depositors with the intention of securing the money pit so that if you didn't know the way to get into it, you'd be stopped by the flow of the Atlantic Ocean. And it's worked very, very well. And it's even suspected that there's more than one flood tunnel. In fact, it's known by treasure hunters that there may be two of these flood tunnels. Who could have devised and built an artificial beach, irrigation tunnels, and a multi-platform pit at least 30 meters deep? Although Oak Island is mired in mystery, there have been some real fascinating finds, including an enigmatic piece of parchment that lay hidden under almost 50 meters of soil and stones. Legends of lost treasure lead to this mysterious Canadian island, where an ancient parchment fragment could hold the clue to a secret burial pit. This piece of parchment actually exists to this day, but it was studied by uh, experts at Harvard University and was declared to be a piece of sheepskin parchment upon which there's writing in India ink done with a quill pen. Uh, other artifacts have been found in Oak Island have been Spanish-style scissors that were found um, under the beach in Smith's Cove a heart-shaped stone that was found in the, in the same area. And um, during some deep drilling exercises on Oak Island uh, back in the 1970s or late 60s, they actually brought out of the ground pieces of chain, pieces of drawn wire, and metal that was so brittle that uh, when it was exposed to air, or was so old that it was exposed to air, turned brittle and oxidized immediately. There's conflicting evidence as to the age of materials found in the pit. Timber has been dated to the year 1575 to an accuracy of plus or minus 85 years. But coconut fibers recovered at the same site were found to be much older. 
There's a lot of skeptical analysis about Oak Island, but one of the things the skeptics cannot explain away is the coconut fiber that has been found on Oak Island and can actually be found on Oak Island still if you know where to dig. Some of this coconut fiber has actually been analyzed and is found to have been from the year from the seventh century or perhaps the sixth century. Now I don't know what the accuracy level is of the carbon dating that was done, but nonetheless that's the information we have to work with. Coconut palms are not native to Nova Scotia. Someone must have brought the fibers there. Some believe the Oak Island pit bears all the hallmarks of the legendary Knights Templar, or their descendants. Engineering skill, military discipline and secrecy. But for one scholar, other equally fascinating scenarios are more probable. If you're looking for people digging tidal pits of Nova Scotia, well, there were all those Vikings who'd settled in Greenland. Couldn't it be them who were doing it? There was still a Viking settlement in Greenland until the late 15th century, and then they disappeared. Where did they go? Nobody knows. Something mysterious is discovered, like a pit or a, a cave with mysterious markings, and then pe people automatically think, oh, it's got to be the Templars. The most interesting theories to me center around the Templar Knights. I find those theories very interesting, although it is kind of tentative. The Templars had ships based at La Rochelle on the northwest coast of France before they were attacked by the ruthless King Philip in 1307. We know that some boats left La Rochelle. What was on them we just don't know at all, and those boats vanished. They would have had to have gone somewhere that was beyond the, the reach of the church and Philip. Um, the places that would have been most likely would have been England and Scotland. But those who think the Templars could have made it to Nova Scotia point to the presence of related organizations like the Order of Malta and the Freemasons, among the region's early settlers in the 16 and 1700s. Yes, there have been some things found with regard to the Templar theory that sort of fire people's imagination. One of the many things that's been discovered on Oak Island is a, uh, a stone with the letter G carved into it. Now, if you do some research on the Masonic Lodge, you'll discover that the, the letter G is one of the symbols that they use in their uh, allegory. And, uh, the letter, and uh, of course, the Templar Knights can be connected with the uh, Masonic Lodge as well. Oak Island is now privately owned. Excavations continue, but so far, no treasure has emerged from the enigmatic tidal pit. Yet real Templar-related treasure does exist. Near the place where the first master of the order, Hugh de Pin, was born, a breathtaking hoard of hundreds of silver coins dating from the Templar period was found in 1998 by Bernard Delacour. The coins were stuck together, forming packages, packages of coins. It was impossible to estimate the quantity to start with, but I nevertheless realized from the beginning that it was a major discovery. But the silver hoard isn't the legendary Templar treasure of biblical wonders, Solomon's temple, or ancient world-changing wisdom. Although they were brutally crushed some 700 years ago, the Knights Templar live on in legends that illuminate modern lives, dulled by grey suburban conformity. We live in this culture which is very, very materialistic and the Templars offer a bit of romance and mystery and intrigue. I think fantasies are to enjoy and to enliven our darkened hours, but we've got to remember that they are fantasy. I know some people base their lives around the Templar myths. I think that's quite dangerous, actually. You can lose touch with reality. Myths and legends are at their most interesting when they remain undeciphered, when they have been created for that purpose. This is more common than you would imagine. They were the elite, the SAS of medieval knights in armor. 
they thought they were invincible. They would go in first, they would come out last. Rich. They were effectively multinational corporations. The keepers of holy relics said to have mystical powers. If you touch them, then you had a connection with God. But when the Templar Knights were smashed by the French king... It was a medieval equivalent of a, a dawn police raid. Their legendary treasure disappeared. They found nothing. Yet alluring and intriguing clues survive, shrouded in mystery. They were fanatically secretive. From ancient French castles and secret codes to an ingenious pit across the Atlantic. If you try and get the treasure, you'll drown. Could this be the tantalizing trail that leads to the lost treasure of the Knights Templar? Turn back the eternal tide of time by almost a thousand years, and an enduring legend begins. A legend forged on the long and dangerous pilgrim route from Western Europe to the Holy Land and the hallowed city of Jerusalem. Travelers risked violence and even death at the hands of bandits who preyed on pilgrims around sacred Christian sites like the Sea of Galilee. A Russian monk who visited the region described the danger in 1106. This place is very dreadful and dangerous. Many tall palm trees stand about the town like a dense forest. This place is terrible and difficult of access, for here live fierce pagan Saracens who attack travellers at the fords. Travel along the roads was very dangerous because any lord who owned land by the side of the road reckoned it was his right to take toll off anyone that passed. Protection money, if you like. Some groups decided not to pay and fought. So notoriously certain pilgrim groups didn't get to Jerusalem because they were either cut to pieces or taken prisoner. Amid the turbulent times of the early Crusades, a small group of devout French knights appeared in Jerusalem, willing to dedicate their lives to Christ. The country needed fighters, not just men that prayed. And so, the later accounts say, they went to the Patriarch of Jerusalem the head of the church in Jerusalem and said, we want to do something to help Christendom, we are knights. And he said, for your sins, I order you to protect the pilgrim roads. These were highly trained fighters and the knights were at the top of the medieval military machine. They were the medieval equivalent of a tank, a fully armed knight on a horse, which was also armoured. Um, it was pretty formidable, so it could have only taken one or two knights to protect a road and keep it fairly safe. They became known as the Knights Templar after basing themselves on part of Jerusalem's historic Temple Mount. Apparently the Templars asked to be based in the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which they referred to as the Temple of Solomon. They believed that it went back to the reign of King Solomon, that great wise king of ancient Israel. The Temple of Solomon had been destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD during the Jewish uprising. So nothing was left, but it was an area steeped in mythology. Solomon was famously the wisest of all men. Once called the Poor Knights of Christ, the Templars became rich, enjoying papal privileges, lucrative tax breaks and lavish donations. The Templars became very rich because people in the West heard about what they were doing and thought, great, I want to help. So they gave them money. They left the money in their wills. They gave them land, which raised an income. They even created their own kind of bank and the equivalent of a modern traveler's check to protect pilgrims' money. The Templars did develop a system whereby you handed in your money, for example, in Paris, you got a chip that said this money has gone in, you present your chip when you arrive in Acre and you could have your money back again. The Templars had become rich and influential in cities across Europe for the pie body of Christ. Could the Templars have secretly removed such treasures from the Paris Temple before their arrest in 1307? When Philip's men went into the Paris Temple on that Friday morning, all they found basically were Templars. Um, they didn't find any treasure troves, no storerooms or chests full of gold. The hunt for the fabled lost treasure of the Knights Templar had begun. According to one alluring tale, a band of French knights escaped before Philip's dawn raid, taking their hoard of treasure west. 
towards England and a former Templar fortress as Gisor. Perched on a huge mound, on Mott, it was here that some Templars found themselves imprisoned in their own tower. Etched into the walls of the so-called prisoner's tower, ancient graffiti can still be seen as Gisor, including enigmatic symbols interpreted by some as clues pointing to the Templars' lost treasure. A chariot, which may have been used to transport riches and biblical relics, and mysterious figures of what appear to be North American Indians. The former Templar stronghold has attracted many visitors through the ages, including a Victor Hugo. But was it the prolific creative artist who wrote Les Miserables who signed his name in the ancient walls? One has to wonder if it was just someone else who engraved Victor Hugo's name. Luckily, we know that Victor Hugo wrote that he really did visit Gisor and that the site had a profound effect on him. In fact, he details that he carved his name twice at the castle. Victor Hugo was not the only one to be enchanted by the enigmatic Templar castle at Gisor. He suddenly showed a huge amount of resolve. He's also said by some chroniclers to have called the Pope and King Philip to meet him before God within the year to account for their actions. This has become known as the curse of Jacques de Molay. And it came true, apparently. The Pope died on the 20th of April, just a month later, of a stomach complaint. And Philip himself died before the end of that year. He died in November 1314 in a hunting accident. Um, he was a fanatical huntsman, and um, but this time um, he didn't come back from the hunt. The place where Jacques de Molay was burnt alive, together with one of his companions, can still be seen in Paris today. Two tomb-shaped portals mark the spot where the life of the last Grand Master was extinguished. But some 700 years on, the legend of the Templars continues to thrive. Myths that have swirled around them through time tell of fantastic treasures and divine relics found deep in the ruins of Solomon's fabled temple. The idea that the Templars were digging into the Temple Mount is a modern one. Nobody at the time wrote about that. And I think the Templars would have talked about it had they been doing it as well, because they liked to advertise their activities as a way of raising money. During some excavations carried out in the 19th century, a tunnel was discovered, which has been dubbed the Templar Tunnel. It's not beyond the realms of possibility that the Templars could have discovered something whilst renovating their part of the temple platform. If they were interested in the legends of King Solomon, one of the stories about Solomon was his fabulous wealth. Apart from, you know, apart from his wisdom, he also had a lot of gold. And we know that the, the treasure of the temple was actually gold and silver and precious stones and so on, which after 70 AD, when the Romans destroyed the temple, went missing. Could such legendary riches excavated from the heart of the Holy Land still lie hidden? in a secret Templar treasury. Links between the Knights Templar and legendary holy relics have some foundation. Evidence recently uncovered suggests the Templars hid the Shroud of Turin, set to hold an image of the Cruces envious cash-strapped French King Philip the Fair. The Knights had become a threat, rivals to his authority that had to be eliminated. Philip was determined to destroy the order and would stop at nothing to achieve his ends. The mighty order of knights would be brought down by charges of the most heinous of crimes, heresy. He had installed spies in the order, he got people to join the order and um, they were reporting back to Philip saying um, strange things are going on. A month before the arrests, secret instructions were sent out to the king's officials, the bailey and the seneschals in the various parts of France and they were instructed the Templars were to be arrested at dawn on Friday the 13th of October and nothing was to be said about this beforehand. So it was a dawn swoop. The medieval equivalent of a, a dawn police raid, it was a very well, a very slick operation that was carried out seemingly without any warning 
um, almost all the Templars in France were arrested. Oh yes, psychology is not a modern invention. It was well known in the Middle Ages that if you want to catch somebody off guard, dawn when they're still in bed is the best time to get them. And the Templars were arrested on this Friday the 13th, something which shocked people, as they were a very powerful and established group, and there were literally hundreds of those centres. And this event was so shocking that to this day, the idea of Friday the 13th in France is synonymous with bad luck. Thrown into prison and tortured, many confessed to shocking crimes of heresy. Philip the Fair, he was very clever with his um, spin doctors. He got them to confess, under torture of course, that they denied Christ and spat on the cross. The charges of heresy were stitched up. These were standard charges brought against other people that the King of France wanted to get rid of and get their money. The Pope was also threatened by the French King's inquisitors and was forced to dissolve the Order of the Templar Knights in 1312. Several years later, after languishing in prison, the Templar's elderly Grand Master Jacques de Molay was burnt to death as a heretic. <laughs> 